Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Content and Conversation. Uh, I'm excited to re-welcome Tom Critchlow back on the program. Tom, uh, for those who are not aware, SEO consultant, or not SEO consultant, consultant, uh, very often (laughs) overlapping with business and SEO, but also runs a great SEO MBA course and program. It's about to launch um, a, a new course as well that we'll talk through on client management today. But uh, yeah, welcome to the program again, Tom. Thanks for having me back. I must have not been too bad last time. <laughs> yeah, to kind of like emphasize that one thing we're testing out, I would definitely appreciate people's feedback. Obviously, I know people like Tom pretty well and had the thesis of those repeat guests might hopefully be the the most interesting and, and build the deeper conversations that hopefully will be the most valuable for people. So uh, we'll give this a spin and starting with, yeah, your client management course, Tom, there's some kind of key components that I think people would be interested to hear in terms of like, what does good SEO consulting look like? Whether you're actually a consultant or you have a consultant, I think it could be interesting to hear what we think tactically both sides of this equation look like. So if you find that your consultant is not doing, or agency is not right. doing any of these things, maybe that's a signal that maybe it's not actually good work that you're actually getting. So um, yeah, starting there, we're, we're kicking off an engagement. Like how, how, how would you suggest people structure a good kickoff meeting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So first of all, I think that um, it's important to realize that, you know, I guess it's kind of a personal bias, but I think it's, I think it's broadly um, true also that, SEO is inherently consultative, right? And I think that's where my like the, the entire thesis for the SEO MBA has come from, which is that um, the communication aspect of SEO is as important, if not more important, than the actual kind of technical mastery and you know day to day skills, um, because we need to convince people to get things done for us, right? Whether that is an agency convincing a client to get things done, whether you're in house and you're convincing the tech team to get stuff done for you, it is inherently consultative, right? And I think that. Um, that's why um, client management, as in, in the kind of broadest form, um, is so important, right? It isn't just about communicating to the client, but it's actually about um, getting things done. There's a, there's, a, there's a limit to how effective we can be if we can't communicate well with the client and convince them to, to do things, um, which I think is the basis for, to answer your question directly, about kickoff meetings, right? I think that the biggest failure I see in kickoff meetings is not properly aligning on who's going to do what. Right. And, and th- there's this kind of, um, uh, I think, um, lazy thinking or lazy habits that the SEO industry writ large has, has gotten into, specifically around this kind of like cadence of, well, we're going to go away for four to six weeks and do an audit. We're going to come back. We're going to show you our recommendations. And then nothing's going to happen. Right. <laughs> um, and and um, nothing, <laughs> no, nothing happens for a number of reasons, um, which we can get into. But I think one of the biggest is simply that we don't properly stop to think about what resources the client has and and how things are actually going to get done. Um, And I think you've got to have that conversation day one, if not before day one, right? Like even in the sales process, um, before you sign the contract is properly understanding like, okay, what resources can you dedicate to this project? You know, how do things move through the development queue? Um, How do you justify projects? How do you scope them? How do you get budget for them? How do you get buy-in for them? Um, And and I think that that's where it's... uh, it's really important to me to, to structure a, a client engagement around the kind of practicalities and the kind of the, the pragmatic sense of what are we able to achieve when um, so that you can structure the entire project around it, right? There's no point in doing a 100-page SEO audit with a whole bunch of kind of best practices if that isn't going to be the thing the client can do anything with, right? Um, so, so, so I think that's kind of the, the, the starting point. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to, to hear about how Siege kind of thinks about kickoff meetings, you must have, I mean, you're kicking off clients probably every week at this point, right? Um, like you must have a kind of standardized process for this. Yeah. I mean, that's a deeper conversation. We actually do not do that to, to make it simple, to smooth out our operations. We now have cohorts that start every two months where we oh, also have a training lead who trains a cohort of new hires kind of tied to that new client starts, which smooths it out. It also has a common start date. So that, that's that been useful and we've gotten good feedback from our team actually mm-hmm. on the less randomness and also predictability of when things start and you get, it, clients always wanna start tomorrow, which right. maybe is a little more feasible with consulting. With our, we have like many touch points with design, editing, et cetera. So it's just not feasible to start that fast right. when you have, to your point, lots of dependencies. Right, um, right. So that's, yeah, one thing we do. And for, to your point, like, I, I agree with everything you said, like our, our process specifically is 
we have a sales call. We always record the call for our team's sake. So if we can get recording permission, we'll record it, ask them to listen to it. We've templatized that uh, in in Basecamp where there's all these to-dos so we don't miss any step of that mm-hmm. onboarding process. We send a client questionnaire that asks some of the things you just talked about of like, uh, what resources do you have available? We definitely try to ask this up front if there's any any questions about that. But just get more clarity on like CMS access and design assets and all that. That then leads into an internal kickoff where we take the questionnaire, we talk about it and bring extern questions to the client. And we bring everyone from the team on that external kickoff. And then in that kickoff, we'll, we'll have those questions. We'll send them in front to the client. We'll have a process rundown. And then we also have next steps immediately laid out of what they can expect. And I've liked to, and actually recently passed to the team a lot of things you recommended, Tom, of one, we should always have a work in progress first asset. Like we should not just deliver a first asset. We give them an outline yep. phase every single time, even if it's a simple piece and trying to t- talk to more stakeholders in the process, bring second meetings with important people. That was an important insight that you helped bring our team in a, in a training you did for our team. Yeah, I think there's um, something really interesting there about a kickoff meeting is often considered like you try and bring everyone to the meeting and you try and kind of get everyone in the room. It's a it's it's trying to achieve multiple goals, both understanding the project and the business, but also trying to be like a meet and greet, right? It's almost like, okay, well, let's meet everyone. Everyone can say hi to the team, blah, blah, blah. But in doing that, I think you sometimes lose that ability to actually properly meet the different stakeholders, right? And, and, and I think you can always think of stakeholders like a capital S there, right? It's like when, when you're doing a client project, there are certain gatekeepers or decision makers within the client's organization you really have to care about, right? Well, you might not talk to them that frequently, but they are people that can, that, that can control the fate of the project, whether they're, they're holding budget or resources for getting things done, whether they're people that control the kind of renewal process and actually like contractual you know, agreement um, that you're agreeing to, or whether it's just ultimately the person that is responsible for the results, right? Um, whoever it might be, um, making sure that you properly understand what they want to get out of the project, what their expectation is for the project, what their level of education is, right? Like who they worked with in the past. Like, and I think it's really hard to do those things in a kind of round table kickoff meeting. Right, you might you might have those people at the de- uh, in the meeting, right, at the sat around table, um, you know, virtually probably. Um, uh, but actually, getting the right information out of each of those stakeholders is is hard, right? And I think um, uh, a kickoff meeting is often a very bland meeting, right? It's a lot of like good energy and high fives, but low on real kind of like depth. And and um, in my experience, I always try and shift that tone into a kind of like you, you know being that like. Um, being that really annoying consultant who's like, but why is that true? Why is that true? Why can't we do like, like I, I want to kind of kind of get get into the good stuff uh, <laughs> more quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of play that naive role sometimes to kind of be like, um, you know, it explains me why we can't just fix this tomorrow. Right. Like I'm not you, you, like, it, you know, explain it to me again. Like, but but why can't we do that? Why can't we do that? Right. Um, and I think that it's really it's really useful to do that um, and to do it early. And I think that that's in my experience, what separates a kind of good kickoff meeting from a bad kickoff meeting is if you can catch, actually leave with a, like having changed your mind about how the project is going to go, not just having kind of presented the, here's our process. And like, then you carry on as if you, as if the meeting had never happened. Right. Um, and so that's kind of a good, a good frame, I think. Uh, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to kind of throw it back to you. It's like, from, from what you have seen, like, what do you think separates a great kickoff meeting from a like average kickoff meeting i think prep is super critical to to your point like i've seen those meetings and we've definitely been guilty of them on occasion where it feels a little like not always is it the most it feel like the most productive meeting of all time like we actually had engagements where it was a huge engagement uh and we're lucky for that but we had like almost 20 people in that call we're like this can't be the right way of doing this (laughs) to your point so i'm like uh it was definitely an expensive meeting it should not have been done um i I think getting all the clarity on the importance uh issues that are roadblocks for us is just super critical and like putting your foot in the ground and getting those answers to your point for us in the content marketing world it's like if we can't do this or we can't do that and it's literally an issue we probably should have solved for it in sales but sometimes there's some kind of miscommunication i always suggest people sprint to it even if it's uncomfortable in that meeting you talked about the smaller meetings just tactically are you 
immediately setting up multiple meetings? Do you do that big kickoff? Are you still doing the big kickoff if you're a company like us or another agency? Or like, how would you tactically break that out um, logically? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, for for me personally, it's it's a little bit um, different because I'm an army of one, right? Um, so I'm I, <laughs> I'm never bringing more than one yeah, person yeah, yeah. to the table from my side. <laughs> um, so I never get twenty person meetings. That would be like nineteen people from the client and one. That that would be a bad that would be a bad <laughs> kickoff meeting. But I think that. Uh, uh, I think the right answer is you do want a notion of like meet and greet, right? So it is useful to have the the slightly round table format and to do some of that kind of alignment and, and, and grounding. Um, and then try and set up those one on ones very quickly afterwards, right? So I want to do those in the first like week or two, if you can. Um, and they can be relatively short meetings. Um, uh, what I'll often do is is use that initial kickoff meeting to actually figure out who the stakeholders are. Right, and to explain why I need to speak to them, because this is the other challenge. Is I've seen it. I've seen agencies have that mindset, and they're like, "Great, we want to go meet all the stakeholders." And the client, who is maybe like a you know SEO director in a Fortune 500 company, is like, "I just can't go get you a meeting with the CMO. Like that isn't <laughs> that isn't going to happen." Um, uh, <laughs> or, or, or more accurately, they're not really motivated or incentivized to know why they should sit at that meeting. Um, and so I find it much easier to explain that in person and be like, "Well, I want to I want to speak to anyone that's going to be." Uh, a stakeholder or have expectations about this project, who would that be, right? So I have to have them tell me, well, we can't speak to the CMO, but we can speak to the head of brand or the head of editorial, or we can't speak to the chief product officer, but we can speak to, you know, the person that, that runs the front end development group or whatever, right? So it's like, yeah, I, I, and again, it's about trying to get to those people that matter, who are actually going to influence the project rather than just the the people who whose job title or label, you know, sounds like the right person to speak to. Um, and then, and then, you know, you want to have that conversation to be like, well, here's why I want to speak to them. I want to speak to them so that we can get things done or so that we can make sure that we're aligning to their expectations or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and, and again, that goes back to client management in its broadest forms being so important, I think, right? Um, and I think it's true for, for the kind of content marketing work that, that Siege does, but I think it's especially true for any kind of consultancy work or any kind of uh, where we're giving recommendations to actually change the client's organization in some form. Um, y- y- it doesn't work if you can't get people bought into the, to the work, right? Um, and so, so the client management is is the work, right? The, 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 that's the that's the thing that's going to make a difference. Um, so agreed. Yeah, yeah. Last tactical thing that not not as relevant to you, Tom, but as we have a decent amount of people in these kickoff meetings, one thing we randomly thought of was to actually set who the introduction order. So we have introductions to begin to call and you have a decent amount of people you randomly am like popcorn over to Joe and Jill. Instead, we just automatically have that list set in Slack such that it almost feels like magic to the client. We've actually gotten random compliments. Like, how did you guys know what order to go in? Right. <laughs> it's a small detail, but uh, it's something maybe some agencies might find valuable. Uh, and well, on the meeting, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, that, so that there's a kind of a, a little idea there, which is actually which is actually a big idea, which is, um, kickoff meetings can feel really forced and awkward because they often don't have a great agenda, right? Like it is a bit of a meet and greet. It's a bit of an open-ended discussion. And I think that uh, I've seen more junior kind of account folks or consultants uh, stumble in those meetings because it's kind of like we don't really actually have a good sense of what we want to talk about when. So like I think what you're talking about is representative of you actually want to care to make that meeting go well. Um, and that's important just because it's a client interaction, but it's important because it's the first client interaction, right? This is the big like reveal of like, well, this is you're meeting a team for the first time. If you, if we lose your trust or credibility and like the, you know, the competency of this team, the whole project is set on a bad path, right? And so I think um, I like the idea of like you know kind of pre gaming the 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 intro order, but <laughs> I think it's representative of like you want to make that meeting go well, right? And you want to make sure that it's, it feels good, it flows well, we talk about the right things. We don't get sidetracked or we don't run out of time. You know, like that stuff is important. Um, it's important for most meetings, but it's especially important for that kickoff meeting uh, because it's that first interaction. Yeah, I agree with that. You made me think of other things, subtle things. Like we, 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 we sometimes have some boilerplate questions we tend to ask clients, but I've always prepped the team and we try to specifically get multiple people talking as part of that sh- meet and greet mm-hmm. round table you described of like, you should know the why of this question. Don't just ask the question because it's on a list of questions because that's going to set us up to look stupid. And you will have situations that that happens. Uh, other things that I occasionally see, to your point, like 
sometimes we'll ask a question like what we had in the past, like what kind of content do you want? And my advice to them and to every consultant is it's our job as consultants to tell them what content they should do, not what uh, they want us to do. Of course, we can take feedback, but those are things that have come up in those questions, those, those meetings very frequently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was working with an agency, this is a few years ago now, and I'm not going to name names, but I was working with an agency uh, doing some kind of um, advisory work. And, and I went along to a kickoff meeting they did with one of the big streaming platforms. Um, you know, so think like a, like a Netflix or a Hulu or whatever. Um, and they're in the kickoff meeting with a client. And one of the like templated kickoff questions is, you know, how do you make money, right? Like how does the business, the business model of the thing, right? And so the consultant sat there and said, okay, so, you know, tell me how this, how the streaming platform makes money. And they're like, well, users pay like 10 bucks a month. Like what? <laughs> like, like, and, and it was like, and the, and the consultant yeah, yeah. was like, oh, right. Okay, great. Like, you know, like check, ask that question. Then we moved on. And it's like, um, you know, the why behind that question is I want to understand better. Like, how do you do revenue reporting? I want to be like, well, you know, tell me, tell me like, are you, are you, are you what's the lifetime value of a customer? Like, uh, you know, what does the sign up flow look like? Um, is all revenue created equal? Like, do you have family bundles? Like, et cetera, et cetera. So there's like, if you understand why you're asking the question, you can kind of go further. But the if you just follow the template, you're going to end up like, uh, and the, 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 the downside is, is that when you ask that template question, you kind of look a bit foolish, you lose credibility. It isn't just like a neutral action. It's like you actually go down in the client's estimation, right? And that's a, that's a terrible place to be, especially at like the very first meeting you're having with them. Agreed. That uh, that's so important, and effectively why that why we we ask them to know the why, so they can, to your point, not ask the question at all. Sometimes, right? Uh, it's better to not ask something. We don't have to ask every question if we know that that's how they make the money from streaming, <laughs> right? But yeah, that, I mean, that's one like very important meeting, probably the most important meeting we will run uh, as consultants, or you'll be a part of if you're in house. There's obviously subsequent meetings. How how should consultants, agencies, even then house people uh, think about those uh, and run those effectively? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of literature out there like how to go run a good meeting. Um, and I think some of those basics definitely apply. Um, I think specifically for, for the SEO and content marketing world, I see a lot of, you know, there's this kind of audit culture that permeates the whole industry where we'll do a lot of data analysis, or we'll do a full like site audit or competitive landscape analysis, keyword research, whatever it might be. And they become very bloated uh, documents or bloated kind of deliverables. And so the meeting becomes it, a lot of the meeting is simply spent kind of kind of showing the things of the client being like, here's page five, here's page six, here's page seven, here's the, you know, like, and, and there's a lot of, um, you spend a lot of time really just kind of like showing or walking through stuff. And I think that it's far more effective to focus on the kind of so what, right? And so you want to get to um, the actual, again, kind of like, what are we going to do with this information, right? Um, and so if it is a site audit, it's like, okay, let's get to the top five actions, recommendations, right? Let's not walk through everything we looked at. Let's just focus on what needs to get done, uh, what's going to have the most impact. Or for a content strategy, let's focus on like, what does this mean for our content going forward or whatever it might be, right? Um, and really trying to focus the meeting into something uh, that talks about next steps, talks about future actions, talks about like, so what are we going to do with this rather than just a show and tell, right? Um, and, and I think that, again, for more junior folks or for, for less experienced uh, agencies or whatever, the hard thing is that you don't always know what the highest impact change is, or you don't actually know what the content strategy is going to do for the client, right? And that's the bad kind of recommendation when you find yourself sat there being like, I actually don't know which bit of this is most important for the client. That is a symptom of not having done the kickoff properly or not having done sales properly or like some, some something upstream, right? Where you get to a point where you're like, I'm just going to walk the client through this 100 page document, right? Like, that's just kind of a bad situation to be in. Um, <laughs> so I think that um, you're really trying to focus on the the so what is really important. Um, I think also having a clarity about what the setting expectations about what the meeting is about as well. So this kind of goes goes hand in hand with that. But like, you know, making sure that you communicate ahead of time, like this is a meeting about X, we're going to talk about this, you know, uh, here are the documents. Um, and then, you know, basics of like good client management, of like sending a client, sending a meeting recap, you know, taking notes, that, all that kind of stuff. Those kind of basics, I think, are important and often um like people talk about them, but actually like actually doing them is another, there's another question. Yeah. I agree with all that. I mean, 
you effectively said it, but like setting agendas ahead of time is one of those basics to your point, like making those look polished, uh, having one of the things we say, we're very often going off, like we will do a monthly check-in most often with clients. We will do very often more meetings in the first couple of months just to kind of smooth out process and things like that. Yep. But we will send, we will suggest people when they send a report, give a TLDR in the email. Like ideally they could get some thoughts from the results of our work just from reading the email in short fashion. It could be bullet points, bold, uh, all that uh, executive summary in the report as well. Totally. And trying to make that as easy as possible. You actually made me realize, I'm curious your thought on this. We've always shipped our reports as PDFs that are just like a big PDF deliverable. Mm -hmm. Should we be doing a, like a deck version of that? Uh, I'm curious of like, if you were uniformly making a r reports outcome thing, would, would you do something like that? Uh, I'm probably a little bit biased because I'm kind of a deck junkie. But um, yes, I think decks work better the more senior you go inside an organization and reporting in particular is a thing that is designed for executive summary like like you want it to be you want it to be executive friendly right um, you want to get to like if you only look at the first five slides of this report you've got all the information you need to know there's more information below and like more details you can put stuff in the appendix you can put charts tables etc um, but you want to make sure you stack that again that kind of so what right at the top right this is the most important thing this is what you need to know this is what's happened this is what's next, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, and I think that um, I think presentations work best for that. Um, there's something about presentations, which I think is also nice, because you can literally have that cut off and be like, just read this bit, just do the first five slides. And then everything else you can actually ignore. Whereas in a long scrolling document, it tends, like, people tend to be a bit more lost. It's kind of a bit more like I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. But like, what am I looking at? What am I, <laughs> what am I supposed to read? What's important? Um, so yes, personally, I think the presentations work better um, for that style of thing. Um, again, uh, some counterpoints about to that might be if it's incredibly data driven, in which case you might want to send a spreadsheet instead of a, a presentation or a spreadsheet with a presentation. Um, yeah, there's some some different alternatives there. Um, but I think uh, I, I tend to bias towards a presentation for most things. But again, I'm also generally working with more senior uh, leaders inside an organization when presentations tend to be more of a currency, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, um, yeah. you know, you talk about running running good meetings and stuff like do you have a dedicated account management layer? And how do you how do you think about the kind of people actually doing the work versus the people actually communicating with clients? Is there, is there a separation at Siege? How does that work? We, we do ask for unicorns uh, in, in some ways where we have a content marketing manager who manages content marketing specialists. And depending on the seniority of the specialists, we will either default that communication to the specialist or let the manager take it. If it's say the specialist is more junior, they might do most of that. And if the person's more experienced, we might still have situations where say, a lot of this correspondence is run by a manager for approval. If there's ever like in uh, any doubt, like make it polished, run it by a manager for for QA. Uh, we'll, we'll often do that. But you do, we've kind of defaulted. We have good writers, we have good communicators, hopefully because they are good at writing on average yep. or hopefully more than average, then thankfully most of the time it's gone pretty well in terms of having that uh not and i know that's rare i know it's right, rare right. at agency maybe we should do it differently but that's how we do it i well i, I think it's a tension it's, uh, i mean every agency struggles with this a little bit i think there's a tension between um again this kind of delivery model which is more service focused especially on the kind of content marketing side versus something that's more consultancy based which is tends to be more kind of like on the seo consulting side um and i think the account managers tend to work it's, it tends to be more common on those like service based uh, side end of the spectrum on the consultancy end of the spectrum it tends to be more common to have you know consultant being client facing and, and so on you kind of need that um, that said even for a situation like uh, siege which is a bit more um, you know uh, service based uh, I, I, personally I still think that you want the account managers to be some some form of expert right and that doesn't doesn't mean they have to be a complete expert or have to be like in the weeds with all of the, all of the, the projects but um, I think that the account management layer that is kind of purely there for account management tends to be a bad a bad look um i just find that that doesn't work as well yeah that makes sense I, I, we also tend to really have one one point two services seo consulting and content marketing content marketing is by far our largest service line so i've had that thought where if we had eight services account manager would make a lot more sense i think but right. since we're not but we've we've run into it of uh, the, the complexities even when we when we have clients who do both 
um, it's not a simple answer to solve. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm, I, I'm curious, and so so if you have your kind of content marketing uh, managers and content marketing specialists being client facing, how do you do? How do you make sure that they're good at managing clients? Like, do you have a training program internally? Like, like how do you? Because I, I find it's often a, a forgotten skill uh, inside agencies, right? There's kind of usually a formal training program for like how to run SEO audits, <laughs> yeah, how to do competitive analysis, all these other things, but like how to manage clients tends to be a bit less of a defined skill. Um, do you have an internal training program that, that you know, d- does that? How do you think about leveling people up? How do you think about like scoring the people in the, inside your agency on like how good they are on that? Yeah, good question. We do have training on it. It's actually part of that two month cohort. We actually have two month, months of training with a dedicated manager level mm-hmm. person who trains new hires. As part of that, actually, I personally am owning the client communication training, live training, which we built out. And and we also have it as a company value, impressed with communication. Like we've we've heard that that is something clients really appreciate about what we do. Um, some like short version client com recommendations we have are respond within 24 hours, business hours or eight business hours. Even, even if you can't give the full answer, say, I received this right. and that I, I will get back to you by date. And, uh, yeah, make it look good, scannable, uh, also communicate bad news in advance. If we know it's going to happen, like if we know something's going to be late, ideally let them know before it's going to be late rather than when it's late. Yep. Uh, also, uh, yeah, if we're say going to be behind on goals because of X or Y reason. If we know that we should tell them a week or two in advance. Like, I think this comes back to your work in progress kind of stuff. Um, yeah, curious. I mean, it's kind of shifting gears a little bit, but if you have any common go-to practices on those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I mean, again, for my own practice, I tend to be because I'm just, you know, a, a party of one. Um, two things are true. One is I tend to be a bit closer to clients and a bit more embedded in their organi- organization. And two, I'm a little bit less kind of delivering a standardized work product and tend to be a bit more, you know, kind of ad hoc or, or ambiguous work. Um, it's kind of consultancy based. Um, but I think the same principles are, uh, apply. I think, um, you know, speed of communication is, is crucially important, right? Um, for like building trust and expectations. Um, I actually think that I actually feel like when you get more senior, you actually start to develop a bit more of a kind of spidey sense of like, yes, no communication should go more than 24 hours without a response. But especially in today's kind of world, some communication needs like a 30 minute response. Like, like, you know, and you can't always Mm -hmm. guarantee that, right? But like, you just you, you you should learn to kind of recognize the signals of like oh the client this is an unusual request from the client or this risk, this request seems to have dependencies like they're waiting for my reply to do something or you know whatever um, those kinds of requests that come from a client I try and jump on like as fast as I can right um, and and again it doesn't have to be a complete answer right so it could be like you know, like I'm on the subway, but here's my quick response. Or like, here's how here's what I think we should do next. Or here's what I'm going to do next, right? Or just to let them know that things are moving. And I think that that, um, I think that builds a ton of trust. That builds a great working relationship if you can if you can anticipate how stressed out the client is when they send that email, right? If it's like a regular request, that's fine. But if they if they have some if there's something about it that makes you feel like the faster you reply, <laughs> the more that stress is going to go down, then you should get that reply to them as quickly as you can. Um, so I think that's, that's, um, that's important. Um, I, I completely agree with you, like delivering bad news, if something's not gonna, if you're gonna miss a deadline, or something's going wrong, like getting out in front of that as quickly as you can. Absolutely. Yeah, I think those are those are those are really important. I also think the the scannability of communication is really important as well, like trying to keep things uh, clear, trying to keep things concise, you know, not burying important information in the fourth paragraph of an email. Um, <laughs> you, you know, I think that stuff sometimes can be, um, again, you kind of lose credibility when you do that, um, which is the opposite of what you're trying to do. Yeah, I'm sure this isn't a problem with you. It's something for new, jun- more junior client managers, one of the things we train them on is like pushing back on clients, going back to that theme of not, not ta- asking them what they want, telling them what they need. Like similarly, they might say, we should do this. We add this ad on this right. link building asset that will never generate a link because it has that ad on it. Um, so that's something we we teach people to do. Another thing is kind of like making life easier on the client in general, like things that might be obvious to many people, but like giving several meeting times. Yep. Uh, we also try to actually give the meeting time in the time zone of the client to 
minimize mental overhead. So if they're your East Coast time, I would give you East Coast time zones. Small things like that kind of all hopefully add up into a positive client experience. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think, um, yeah, pushing back on clients, I think, I mean, that could be a whole, that could be a whole podcast episode. Um, uh, you, you know, I think that <laughs> w- one of the things that I think is really interesting about pushing back on clients is how often your first instinct is wrong, right? So, so I think you often get something from the client that at first, that first understanding feels quote unquote stupid, right? And, and, and you back when I worked at like in an agency and I had like agency team members around, the number of times we'd be like, oh, this client doesn't get it. This client is stupid. This client is like, <laughs> you know, they don't know what they're talking about or they're pushing us in the wrong direction. Um, and I think that that stuff's really unhealthy. I think that that kind of language and that kind of perspective is really unhealthy. Um, and instead, in my experience, it's it's far more common that a request that seems unreasonable or misguided to us is actually a symptom of us not having the complete picture of what's going on with the client, right? Um, and and so when the client is like, "I want to put an ad on this landing page," is it because they suddenly have new revenue targets from their boss? or because they have this big advertiser that's really important to them, they need to maintain that relationship. Like, what is it that makes them want to put that ad on the page, right? Like, like y- you know, um, in my experience, it's it's not usually the case that clients are just being stupid or like willfully, you know, ig- <laughs> like, like uh, misaligned with what you're trying to do. They actually have some intent behind it, some goal behind it. Um, or they're just passing along the request from somebody else, right? And this is the other, if you're dealing with like the SEO manager, inside a big organization, the SEO manager might have just had a request from their boss to put the ad on the page. And so again, it's like, actually, this isn't a request coming from your client, it's coming from somebody else inside the organization. So um, I always say that when when something doesn't seem to make sense, you, your, your first line of defense is to understand where it came from. So before you try and push back on it, before you try and you, you know so say no or try and you know, convince them otherwise, the first thing is to understand why they said that. Why did they? Why did they recommend this course of action, or why did they not do the thing they said they were going to do, or why are they asking for this thing that's unreasonable? Um, and then you can actually start to address the real concerns. Um, and, and it's it's far more common in my experience when you do that, you'll find out that the CEO has a new mandate, or there's a new CMO who just joined the organization, or there's some new revenue pressures, or there's some kind of like, um, like there's like an advertiser, you know, who's unhappy, and we need to really like make them happy. So we're going to try and you know add this content marketing piece into the into the package for them, or whatever it might be. Um, and, <laughs> and and when you look at the project through your narrow lens, it might seem unreasonable, but when you consider the totality of the client's kind of context, it becomes much more. You can understand why they're asking for it, and then you can push back on it more more um, with a more nuanced approach of being like, well, listen. We can put the ad on the page, but we think that we'll get 50% of my links or whatever, right? Because you're doing that. So is that a trade-off you want to make, right? So again, it's less about us saying no, or you can't do that. And it's more about us helping the client understand the implication of what they're asking for. Um, and then the client can make the decision. Because I think, again, even when you're doing, even when you're doing kind of pure consultancy work and you're working with various senior people, the, the decisions are almost always still the clients, right? It isn't it isn't about us making decisions for the client. It's about us making, uh, us giving the client the information they need to, to, for them to make decisions. Um, and I think that distinction is maybe subtle, but I think really important. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's kind of what I, that's, that's my fallback is always to try and like get to the kind of why behind, you know, like understand where the ask came from. Yeah, no, I, I like that and agree completely. Like give them, give them the information and tell them what will happen if that situation happens in terms of the KPIs we're held to. And as long as they know that and they prove it, then we're in the clear. It's like, if you don't take, give them that information and know that our specific KPIs are at risk, then that will fall back on right. us. And you and you remind me of one of those situations that we tell the team that's very similar is like very often a client might come off pretty harsh or mean uh, in community co- correspondence. And similarly, you got to figure out I tell the team, we can just hate this client or we can be empathetic to what's happening. Maybe they are have missed earnings or, uh, or the, the business is downstrending and they have a ton of stress coming from above. It's your point. And all, another situation we've had happen is culturally the the company, maybe they have a ton of people in, in India and they communicate more bluntly, I think, because maybe just like communication barrier sort of forces that action. 
or at least that was my hypothesis slightly. And maybe they're not terrible people. It just kind of is just sort of the context of these different cultural standards that at least if we enter, we ask ourselves that question, we might be a little more, we might not take it as offensively uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think having empathy for clients is a is a huge, uh, uh, um, a huge value add. If you can learn to have empathy for for for, for you know the humans on the on the other end of the phone, right? The the humans at the client's organization and why <laughs> what they care about, why they care about, it, and so on. I think that's really important. Um, I also think it's so important to again comes back to this question of context, right? Um, I, I've seen this, you know, with, with the consulting work that I do, I'm often actually hiring agencies on behalf of clients, right? So I'm like coming into a client's organization, figuring out the strategy. Part of that strategy is we should bring some agencies to deliver on X, Y, and Z. And so I get this kind of like inside of you. And one of the frustrations I see quite commonly is um, by the time the agency is hired, you might be six, nine, 12 months into a strategy that's failing. Right. And so by the time the client, by the time that the agency starts work on day one, the client is already like behind as far as their boss is concerned, right? As far as the CEO is concerned or whoever it might be uh, uh, upstream, right? And so, so when you're like, well, we're only three months in, like you can't expect us to deliver results. But the, but the client is actually looking at the project slightly differently where they're like, well, our content marketing efforts, right? Which the first 12 months were done with this other agency and then some internal resources is now, and now with you guys is actually like 18 months in um, isn't working very well and so for you to be sat there being like well we've only been here for three months is like that isn't going to fly as far as the ceo concerned like which is not to say that it's unreasonable right like like you have only been working on this three months you haven't seen results yet right so like that you do need time but having that empathy for where the client's coming from to understand that the position they're in is this is a this is a project that has been ongoing and has not been working very well right um and so you're there as an agency like you kind of have to understand that context and have that empathy for the client to understand like, yeah, they're being a bit mean or they're being a bit short-sighted because, you know, this is not their first rodeo, right? <laughs> this is not like, we're not starting from a kind of blank sheet, of, uh, <laughs> you know, like day one with infinite runway in front of us. We're, we're in the middle of a, a kind of messy, you know, multi-year, whatever. Um, and and we got to try and help as best we can, right? And, and again, this goes all the way back to the, the kickoff meeting where I think it's really important to try and get to those contexts to be like, what do you really want to see and how quickly and like what what matters to you? Like who needs to see what on what time scale? Um, and then you can't always fix those things, right? You can't wave a magic wand and make the project go faster, but you might be able to at least align the priorities of the project to the priorities of the stakeholders, right? Or like, like try and show that things are moving in the right direction or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, but like that empathy piece is, is really important. In getting to know the client as well, one thing we tell our team is to say the client is... Who, who are, or our point of contact, our job is to make them look good effectively. Like the point of contact hires us. And very often we have to do that through growing the account. But if we can achieve making our point of contact look good in, ter- in, in the organization, we've accomplished really the goal. Uh, and sometimes like that might mean one, being empathetic to their situation. Like we've talked about, we also do like micro wins. We suggest really letting that point of contact know when any good outcome that's yep. notable happens so they can kind of uh, evangelize that internally. But th- those are things that that come up um, a yeah. lot. And yeah, yeah, when, yeah, when you have that mindset, I'm curious also for Siege because I can imagine that on the content marketing side, you actually work with a very wide range of job titles. Like I bet your, your point of contact within client organizations must be all over the place, right? Um, from like SEO manager to content marketing to just marketing to you know like all kinds of things um and so i think that when you put that that context of like making them look good that means very different things to lots of different people right yeah it does i mean that's a fair point and it's not always easy to immediately figure out it is interesting going into some companies you'd be surprised that many come in the door and they're like we actually don't care about revenue on this right <laughs> we, we're, we're like trying to hit traffic goals right now for the first six months and that surprises me. Uh, and some people only care about links. We don't like those clients, honestly. Uh, right, so right. in those situations, we might report different things to them. But that, yeah, it, it does vary re- relatively dramatically, which makes it difficult to, right. to navigate that context. That thing we talked about with um, reporting, right? I think one of, the, one of the aspects of a good report is if it has the ability to travel internally, right? Um, so whatever report you send to your point of contact, you can be certain that they're sending some version of their own report onto their boss and their team internally, right? And so 
the more that you can do to make the report that you send already CEO friendly or already CMO friendly, like already has like, it's already pretty, it's already got the executive summary, or even if they just like, if it's if it's kind of pre pre cut, like, like, you know, please cut here, um, it, it kind of <laughs> so they can just send, just send the first five slides of this onto your boss. And then you can look at the, the whole the whole deck. Um, that just makes them look good, right? It makes their job easier, right? So again, is that it's like you're putting that empathy, like put yourself in their shoes to make their their life easier by passing, m- making sure that they can circulate it inside the company more easily, right? Um, you know, and, and and again, that goes all the way down to like day to day interactions of being like, you, you know, even simple things like asking a client, do you want me to draft the email for you to write to the head of product to get this stuff done, or like, do you want me to? Like, you, you know, like, like just those little things, like make things easier for them, right? Like where, where clients might feel uncomfortable asking, or they might not lean on you for that stuff. But when you offer it or where you're proactive, it makes a world of difference, right? And again, it's about, it's about those things that are kind of critical inflection moments for the project, where you really need the product office, the chief product officer to, to, to be, to like come online, right? Like to, to, to support the project. And so that email is actually really important. And if you leave the client to write it, either they're not going to write it or they're going to write it as like some kind of, they're not going to write it how you would write it, right? So um, I think that uh, sometimes going above and beyond to suggest those things or help with those things that aren't really in the traditional kind of scope of like, you know, deliverable, like a, like an, like deliverable for an agency, but are things that will, that will really keep the project moving, right? I think that's also the sign of great client management is doing whatever it takes to keep the keep to keep the client to keep the project going in the right direction. A lot of good tips there. I thought about the deck situation in, in a recent point and uh, something I also like about doing decks versus reports via PDFs. Is this a more natural conversation for meetings mm-hmm. to me? Like you send that giant PDF that's impossible to read through, you can't naturally read that on the next meeting, right? So that's just yet another benefit to it. Um, but completely agree on that. I mean, they, these are some themes here of like taking the work off the client. Is is there anything else on writing emails or communication that's so, sort of in your best practice uh, framework that we haven't talked about? Yeah, probably the only the other the other big thing that that I like to think about, and this is a a slightly more kind of advanced uh, perspective rather than the kind of basics, um, and something that I see again a lot of folks in the SEO space getting wrong is it's our job as experts to uh, add clarity to a project, right? Um, and what I mean by that is like, when we speak to a client, every client interaction should leave the client feeling uh, like they have more clarity about what's going on and what needs to be done than before. And actually, that's not true <laughs> of a lot of a lot of people in the SEO space, <laughs> right? Like they talk about a lot of um, jargon, they'll talk about all of the hundreds of different ranking factors, they'll talk about a 100 paid SEO audit, like they'll get into a lot of the details of the stuff. And it's like, Clients come come away feeling like they have less clarity than they did before, right? That was like I'm a bit overwhelmed. Like they talked about a ton of different stuff. Um, and the, the the best best kind of articulation of this is, you know, yes, SEO is a million different ranking factors, right? We all know that, but it's our job to educate the client on for this industry, for this project, for where we are right now. The top three things we need to do are ABC, right? And just like trying to say, you know what, for now. For where we're at, we don't care about site speed. Or, you know, for now, for where we're at, we don't care about links. For now, where we're at, we don't care about X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and really trying to frame the project inside, you, you know, like, we are the experts. And with my expert lens, I can say you can ignore all of this stuff. And so that we can shine a spotlight on these things that are really going to matter. Um, and this is a function not just of uh, kind of kind of best practice in terms of like what the client and their industry needs. But it's also a function of resources, which is a function of what what are we able to get done, right? Like site speed, we might take site speed off the table, not because it's not important, but because we spoke to the tech team and there's no way they're going to do that in the next six months. So, <laughs> you know, we're just going to take that off the table. Right? Look, I'm not going <laughs> to talk about it because it's not going to happen, right? So just leave that for now. Let's focus. Let's add clarity. When we talk about when we talk about getting results that you want, the things that we need to do are one, two, and three, right? Like that's the you want that kind of lens of clarity. Um, and and I just see so often folks coming at this from a kind of a, a completionist or best practice perspective to be like, I want to talk about all of the factors, or I want to talk about all of the best practices, or I want to talk about all of the problems because I identified them, because I found them, because you, you know, like that's part of our audit process or whatever. And it's like that's just kind of productive to actually getting things done. Um, and clients always appreciate 
clarity, right? If they can, if they can translate in their mind, oh, the, the, this big budget that we're spending, this big project we're doing is really just these three things. If they can get that clear in their mind, they have a much better chance of talking about those three things when they sit with the CEO or when they sit with the, the CTO, or like when we're, we're kind of arming them with clarity. And that's a, that's a really powerful thing to do. Um, uh, not always straightforward also, right? Like having, like, it does take a little bit of like actual experience and expertise to kind of narrow the focus. Um, but I think it's, I think it's really important. Um, and again, I, I, you know, I, I'm curious, like on your perspective from the content marketing side, like there are tons of things that can make content successful, but I'm betting for each client, it really boils down to like one or two things that you need to get right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's fair to say there's definitely situations where they're blog, like recently we've more content's being published. We have more maturity with clients. The world's getting more competitive. We're in the last year been thinking more about the hub itself. Like mm -hmm. where's content as a hub living or the best practices there to like not make our content nine steps from the homepage and buried and uh, poorly optimized. And like, you're not going to get time on site up and all of those things are very often lost. So we'll kind of come into engagement, making that recommendation that it's an important change they need to make. Right. And you actually made me think of like, of our consulting product. We personally, I've also always hated audits. I don't like audits. Right. Uh, hate might be a little strong, but <laughs> I per personally prefer the model of iterative, smaller, engagements because I think for a lot of reasons you mentioned, like you see the stuff through, you can emphasize certain points, uh, you make sure it gets done. There's not a ton of stuff in the audit in the bottom fourth that really will not move the needle at all. Right. It, it just r rarely seems to align to that. I'm sure there are exceptions, but it seems to incentivize a big doc, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, I, I, I will go as far as I hate audits. Um, I, I think they're, I think they're, <laughs> um, they're, they're bad work products that we've got stuck in as an, as an industry. Um, I think one of the, one of the hidden costs of a, of a, like a long audit or like a long set of recommendations is that there's the kind of like the top three or the top five things that are actually going to move the needle, but they often tend to be things that are hard to do, right? Because they're, Going to move the needle, right? <laughs> it's hard to find things that, that move the needle and are very easy. Um, and so what happens is you kind of present this long list of things we need to get done. We say these are the top five things, and the client says, ah, "I can't do any of those five things." Oh, but look at these cool things that are the, the bottom of the list. We can do we can do those. We can get <laughs> we can we can do Jira tickets for those. Um, and so you kind of naturally end up kind of reducing to the to the lowest common denominator, right? Reducing to the, to working on the things that you can get done which ends up doing a lot of busy work. You end up doing a lot of like best practices and like technical fixes, which aren't actually going to move the needle, right? They're things that are nice to haves or incremental benefits or whatever. And you tend to kind of like, it reduces the emphasis on the things that are actually going to matter, right? And, it, and it, it stops you from saying, actually, you know what? These top five things that you say are hard to get done, I want to have a, a like a long conversation about each one of them and make sure that we can't get them done and figure out when we can get them done and make sure that I'm articulating properly to you the value that we might get if we did them, right? And I think that that, that mentality of like saying, I, I don't want to just sweep them under the rug because they sound hard because it's the hard things that are going to get the biggest results. Um, and so I think that, the, again, that, that audit mentality sometimes naturally optim ends up pushing you down the path of smaller changes, smaller fixes, incremental wins that are, that are actually not that important. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of audits, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Agree. Like uh, the rare situations we've done them is I'll actually go in the door. I'll frame it as high impact and actually specifically try to make it low amount of hours. So right. it's like, we're not going to get you everything under the sun. This is only going to be the big stuff. Maybe they just don't want recurring engagements under them for whatever reason i understand that uh i think that might be the one lens that's okay it's still not probably ideal as seeing it through because to your point you got to get shit done yeah i, I mean, listen, different routes very often sometimes fixing the platform is the right answer also right sometimes there's enough like low-hanging fruit and like things are just screwed up so sometimes an audit is like yeah actually there's a checklist of things to fix like that's fine if, if those things are going to have enough impact and be important enough then great but i the the, the number of times and that's true certainly for big clients is, is, you know, I think dwarfed by the number of times when it's not true. <laughs> Agreed. So we, we talked through some presentation best practices at various points throughout this. Like, what would you add to that, if, if anything, in terms of your, your toolkit there? 
uh, I, again, I could talk about presentations for a long time. Um, uh, I think that um, we talked about an executive summary. I think that's really important. Um, uh, I think that having a this is like a, like like a hill I'll die on. Like having a single point to each slide and making sure that point is in the slide title is just a it's like foundational and like sounds obvious or basic, but but is very rarely actually well done. Um, so often I see slides that say something like you know site speed or content strategy or like performance at the top, right? And it's like, I want the most important text on the page to, <laughs> to say the thing, which is like, you know, uh, uh, our site speed is so uh, speed's 50% bad. worse than our competitor. Fixing it could lead to X million dollars. Or, you know, um, performance this month was up 50%. Uh, we attribute that to the following three projects, right? Like, what, I want that, if you don't see anything else on the slide, if you just read the title, I want you to come away with understanding what it's about. Um, and that's really important for, two reasons one it, it makes stuff easier to read but specifically it makes it easier to read for, for senior executives right and we've probably all been in the meeting where like the cmo or the ceo is there and they have the they have the presentation like printed out and they're like they're just flipping through it they're just like what well, okay next page next page next page right and they're not they're just scanning right they're trying to understand the shape the kind of narrative arc the main the main beats and if you have a if you have a slide that just says site speed, that just says site speed, whatever, like you know, blah blah blah. Um, what you need is is you need to read the titles, and if they if all they do is read the titles, they get the point, they get what is going on in the presentation. So that's the first thing. And the second reason, again, is back to this point about the fact that um, stuff travels, right? So stuff goes like just because you're presenting a, a, a presentation, it has to be designed to be passed around on email afterwards as well, right? It, like it's gonna a good presentation won't just sit with your point of contact; it'll also go to their boss or their coworker or their team or whatever it might be. And you need to make sure that it has that kind of explainability to go with it, right? It doesn't rely on you being there to add the voiceover um, or to like add the emphasis. Um, the important things should be important on the slide, right? It shouldn't be about you saying it. It should be about, that should be naturally obvious to, to the presentation. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, do you, you know, think, yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Do you think uh, a curious uh, conversation I recently had in um, the Growth Comet agency group recently was tech for presentations? It might be more sales rather than internal, but do you think it? you have a passionate opinion on whether or not you should have a thing that like tells you when someone opens a presentation should always be a PDF? Uh any opinion or thoughts on that? I, I could, broadly speaking, I could care less. <laughs> um, I think that uh, by the time you're focusing on those details, like I, everything else better be world class, I think, right? Like you're focusing on a good presentation is going to trump any kind of like deliverability t details. Um, the only thing I will say is, um, and, and you mentioned that you do this, is I've seen agencies uh, increasingly starting to adopt um, like something like Gong or some kind of like a uh, um, call recorder. Um, for sales meetings and even potentially for like client every client interaction, um, and I've actually like the that that I think is a change like that didn't that was not nearly as common back when I was in agency worlds back in you know 2011 2012, um, and I think it's a really positive change because it allows you to actually go back and like review game tape and be like, okay, let's go back to the first interaction we had with the client when they first came in the door. What did they say? Like what was their what was their motivation for coming to talk to us? <laughs> or like what was the language they used during the sales meeting? that we can go back and check that we're aligned to, right? And um, I think that's useful for people who are like on the projects, like, you know, get up to speed, get all the context. But I also think it's important for like training situations where you can actually tell people to go back and be like, oh, go back and listen to this meeting, right? And, and you know, watch for X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think that that, um, I think that piece of tech is a, is a, is a, is a interesting and kind of useful piece of tech that has increasingly been adopted. But you know, knowing when it's been opened, like PDF versus slideshow or whatever, it's like I, all of those questions are uh, less interesting to me. Yeah, it, it's it probably a little more sales focused and it's it's a rounding error at like enterprise. Like you probably have to be doing so much significant volume to pick up the one time that's that somehow mattered. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I was curious, but 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 makes sense. Uh, so, I mean, we're on the subject upselling. Maybe it's internal upselling. How, how do you do that effectively? Yeah, this is actually interesting because I said earlier that I wasn't a fan of account managers. Like, I, I feel like I, I like to have the kind of the the experts interfacing directly with clients. But upselling is one of those points that you tend to get. You, you tend to have have people doing less upselling if you don't have account managers, right? Like, account managers like are, are good at upselling. It's one of the things that they like specifically watch for and like look at as part of their job description. Consultants and subject matter experts tend to be 
uh, less keen on or less primed or less in the mood to um, upsell clients on things, um, which I think is is kind of interesting. Um, you, you know, ultimately, I think the upselling comes from from two places. It comes from one having clarity of um, like the 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 scope of the project. So so making sure that the, the the SOW that you signed and the agreement that you signed, the contract and the the project is well scoped, right? So that you, so you know what is in scope and what is out of scope. Um, otherwise, you can't really upsell anything because it's unclear whether it was included or, to, to begin with. Um, so having a clear, <laughs> clear scope and understanding what that scope is, like going back to it, checking it, you, you know, familiarizing yourself with it. Um, that's the first piece. And then the second piece is con- looking at upselling as, um, as, a, as a service, as a value add, right? Like upselling should come from a place of there's this thing that is additional value to the client. And so we want to make sure the client is aware that they that that's an option that they can do it, right? Um, and I think that having that kind of service mentality, um, in my opinion, does uh, specifically helps people like consultants and you know content marketing managers or whatever who are who are more, more in the work remember and understand that upselling is a thing that they can be doing and should be doing, right? Um, and and so thinking about it as well, we should properly understand what the client's resources are, right? What they're what they're able to do, what they're not able to do. And then we should augment that with whatever resources we can offer, right? So whatever we can upsell into, whether it's additional pieces of content, whether it's additional copywriting, whether it's additional design, landing pages, you know, whatever, however the, the kind of upselling goes, um, that should be seen as a, as a service to the client. It should be seen as something that they, they, that they find they are appreciative of us bringing up rather than us like trying to ram down their throats. Like, hey, did you know we also did this, this thing that, you know, you, like, you know, buy two, <laughs> get one free um, uh, kind of thing. Um, but but it's hard, right? Like the the devil is also in the details of like it, it's it's a you know you're asking for a unicorn for somebody who can do the work and manage clients, and like you're really asking for a unicorn if you want somebody who can do the work, manage clients, and do sales. <laughs> that is a that is a very difficult uh, a, a triangle to to, to meet. Um, so I think it's also about educating uh, educating consultants and experts that their job is not necessarily to do the upsell. But to identify the value of the upsell, and then and then bring a salesperson in, or bring an account manager in, whatever, right? So it's like a little bit less about about putting the complete onus on them and being like, you should scope it out, you should price it, et cetera, because that can be hard to find somebody who's really good at that. But more about saying, you know, let us know when you see these opportunities, or you see you see resource constraints at the client's end, or you see you know big value add opportunity for for doing one of our other services, whatever it might be. Um, that's how I think about it. Um, but yeah, we'd we'll be interested to know like how yeah. it works at, at your side. Like, do you do you do you get the salespeople back involved at upsell, or do you like leave it all on the all on the shoulders of the the marketing manager? Yeah, we don't really do that many upsells. Uh, we probably could be better at it, but the, the way we do do it is processizing it within reports. So the way it contextually makes sense for us that we train our teams to do is. If you're behind a competitor, we will have them report on link velocity. It just naturally is a thing to mention. Yep. So we'll say link velocity and also content, number of co- pieces our competitors have. Yep. So that'll be a natural kind of conversation point in reports that is also an upsell effectively. Like if you don't have the velocity to catch them, you need more content marketing. Right. If you don't have enough content and they're outpacing you, you need more content. So hopefully that's a less salesy way yep. of doing it. But I love that idea of resourcing, keeping your ear on resourcing that's like such a critical like hint of where you could come in and plug in and, and upsell. Um, we don't have as many services. We still have enough that we probably could do more of that. But yeah, I mean, I think it's about I think it's about understanding the again. It isn't necessarily resource constraints as much as just like like if we're taking up design time for the client's team. I'm sure that design resource can be working on other things as well, right? So again, it's like being like, hey, would you want like do you want us to take that off your plate? Like free up those designers to work on other projects, whatever it might be, um, especially when projects are going well, I think it's great. It's a great opportunity to kind of come in and be like, do you want to just give us more of the project, like give us more of the the full kind of service of this of this work um, so that you can you can free it up. Um, the, the other advice, and, and this is kind of, um, again, it's going to sound very obvious, but it's just asking the client when it's okay to upsell them. So like, like, maybe not right in the like kickoff meeting, although you can do it then, but like, explicitly having a conversation with a client to be like, hey, when when is it when when the budget's reviewed? Or like, you know, uh, you, you know, when can we have the conversation about doing twice as much twice as many pieces, right? Or whatever. Right. And, and again, you can use that context, like you said, like link velocity or the, the gap with the competitor or whatever it might be, and just be like, 
I'm not going to upsell you right now, but like when would be a good time for us to have that conversation, right? And and what's interesting about that is that, um, uh, and this is true actually for making kind of SEO recommendations as well, but it, timing really matters, right? And and especially the the bigger the company, the more true this is, which is they are going to have an annual budget review, right? And so we need to understand when that process happens, and we need to get in front of it early enough so that our upsell or and or renewal can align with whoever is putting a report together for the CMO and the CEO to say our marketing budget for next year is this and that accounts for you know paying siege twice as much as they did last year because everything's going great but like if you don't if you try and do that upsell out of the out of cycle you're going to have a much harder time right because budgets are already set resources are already allocated you know big companies like to kind of know where they stand and they like to control um control uh, finance better so again simply asking can be a can be a powerful tool in the upsell arsenal to be like um you know when is the right time and then when they tell you the right time then you've got the perfect like now you have permission to come back with it now you're like hey you said at the end of the year <laughs> we should do this yeah. but it's the end of the year so we're gonna do this right um that's just like it sounds like a small thing, but like psychologically, it makes a huge difference on both sides. It's just like having that permission um, to, to come back and have that conversation. Yeah, like that. And one thing we've realized as we've scaled, we buy, we're enterprise, so we don't have a massive, massive volume, but there, there's no doubt it's an obvious f- f- mention, but mm-hmm. December and January are the peaks for this. Like, are we have the most inbound leads in December and January? Right. Uh, need to dig into those other points. Definitely February has a lull, often because of January. Mm-hmm. There'll be like, I haven't deployed my budget yet, right. people, kind of right, people. Right. And then there's randomness. There's people on quarterly, mid-year, uh, and sales don't go away, but there's no, I think it's probably logical it, for most companies, it's it's year end. There's definitely outliers in different scenarios, especially at enterprise. Right. But right. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen other peaks and valleys pretty consistently that you, uh, but that that seems the obvious one for most if you had to guess. In yeah, totally. Scenarios. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's definitely been true, right? It's like fall tends to be a busy time, wrapping up all the way up to the end of the year. Um, summer is like, you know, quieter, et cetera. Um, you know, I think it's interesting also, uh, I, again, I have a kind of unique vantage point because I, I do such embedded work with clients. So again, I'm often uh, putting budgets together in first places, like hiring agencies and bringing them in. Um, you know, it's interesting that kind of end of year rush is often a like October, November budget planning session first. Right. So, so what happens internally at the client's end often is what is our budget for 2022? Um, they decide on their budget and they put that plan together for the year ahead in October, or they start putting the, the plan together in October, November. As that budget starts to get finalized, that, that starts to hit your inbox as a lead where they're like, okay, well, I've already allocated 15K a month for content marketing. So now let's talk. Is Siege going to do that 15K a month that we've allocated in the budget or not? But there is a, there is a moment before that when the client actually figures out what they should be spending in the first place. And I think that, um, so for, so for, for Siege, for example, uh, understanding that for like existing clients and upsells in particular, you want to make sure you're having the conversation as part of the budget planning meeting, not after the budget planning meeting has happened. Right. So it isn't about saying, I agree. Like, hey, you, you've already agreed your budget, but we want twice as much. Like, that's a much harder conversation again than, oh, you're in budget planning session. Like, hey, well, can we sneak in twice as much budget? Like, that's a, like we can ask for it, right? Like, um, and again, treating the client sometimes as a partner to be like, you know, why don't between us we try and double this budget um, <laughs> and and see what happens? And we can always get told no, but you know, b- being a partner to the client in that way um, is uh, is an interesting perspective. But again, I don't see a lot of agencies. I don't see a lot of agencies understanding that kind of nuance and distinction of like yearly budgeting and like even just the approval process or like knowing like who is signing off on which bits of the budget, right? And where is this budget coming from? Is it in the marketing department, tech department, product department? Who's signing off on that? What is the timing of it? Like, you know, what format do you need that budget in, right? You know, some companies need like a like a like a MBA level like Excel spreadsheet with like a like a financial forecast. Some companies just need like a finger in the air, like I want to spend money on marketing. Yeah, like it's like it's very it's very <laughs> very client dependent, right? But again, understanding what the client needs is the first first hurdle, right? Once you understand what they need, then you can put together um, the materials, the upsell, the data, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a you know again, enterprise companies like yearly budgeting and yearly planning is like it consumes like a whole quarter, right? Like the whole last quarter is on planning. Um, and so it can be a lot of work, um, but you know, the trade-off is you get big budgets. So 
Yeah, <laughs> worth fighting for, for sure. Well, this is great, Tom. I think we could go forever on this concept and we definitely could save it, hopefully for another conversation. But uh, obviously we t- tackle a lot of things that are going to be in your your upcoming uh, course. Tell people about that. When is it coming out? How can they find it? All that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, no, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was great. Um, we should we should do more of them. Um, so uh, so yeah, you can find everything on uh, seomba.com. Um, I'm uh, I'm kicking off the beta for the next course actually in a couple of weeks. Um, I, those are those betas are already kind of counted for. Um, that's my way of basically like workshopping the material. That's kind of my like um, you know stand up comedy in the basement <laughs> somewhere um, to kind of workshop <laughs> and, and, and see what works. Um, once the material is kind of ready, um, I'm hoping to launch the course. Um, before summer, so like May, May, June sometime, hopefully the next course will be out and, and folks can sign up. But um, if you want to know about it, if you want to stay in the loop, um, and if you want to get the SEO MBA email, then seomba.com is a place to go. Yeah, great, great newsletter, independent of the course. So highly recommend anyone in SEO uh, go follow that. So thanks for coming on, Tom. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the chat.